Good morning to all of you to welcome. If you would, please find your Bible. And if you are at home, please grab your Bible. And if you would open your Bibles to Acts the 28th. Acts the 28th. We have been journeying through the book of Acts for some time. And today is the last one of the series. The last part. We're looking at the very last chapter in the book of Acts together. We had left the story dealing with Paul as he had gotten to the Isle of Patmos, uh, excuse me, of Malta, when there was a shipwreck. And the shipwreck had destroyed the boat that they were in, the ship that they were in, and they had all been saved. And if you know the story about how he got bit by a viper, and yet he lived, and everybody thought, oh, this is bad, bad. But anyway, they eventually, after the winter was over, there had been a ship that had stayed there. They all got on that, and they made their journey to Rome. And so right in Acts 28, we begin with verse 11. Luke, who is writing this story and shares this with us, said, And after three months, we put out to sea, and in a ship that had been wintered in the island. It was the Alexandrian ship with a figurehead of two twin gods, Castor and Pollux. So he set out for sailing on that with these two gods that were there. I put some picture up there for you to see. I don't know why that particularly was inspiring to them, but they had this on the front of the ship and made that journey. So they got going, and verse 16 goes on and said, When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. And basically, that's the story that Luke ends and tells. He doesn't really go into what happened after that experience with Paul. We don't find the t- trial. We don't find what taken place. Remember, Paul was called to go, go to uh, uh, Rome because he made his appeal to Caesar because of the trials that had been going on. Surprisingly, I find Luke, Luke's account ends with Paul's arrival in, in uh, Rome. It doesn't go on. I'm kind of wondering, well, why? Why is that happening? Why did he quit? Well, evidently, he went on somewhere else. We don't know. But he probably didn't stay there, or he would have written more. I'm assuming when we get to heaven, we can sit down with Luke and say, hey, that was kind of an abrupt end. Could you please share with me what you were doing? After I get to talk with the John, the Apostle John, I'll talk with him first. But uh, my favorite book in the Bible is the Gospel of John. I just love it. I love to read it. So I can't wait to meet him. So it is surprising that Luke, in his story, in his accounting of this, in his story, that it ends with him just arriving at Rome. And that he had a place, and that there was someone that was a guard that was placed there. Because now Paul is an old man. He needs help. So where do we find that rest of the story that we need to pull together? Well, it's in Paul's own words as he wrote to 2 Timothy. If you look at 2 Timothy, he wrote to Timothy and shared this experience about what happened after, what he was taking place. And it's kind of a heart-wrenching story as he shares with him, as Paul writes this and shares this with the congregation and with us today as we hear this. And so he wrote this letter to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, this is about the very end of your Bible, If you look there, 2 Timothy chapter 4, we'll look at verse 16. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against him. Did you catch that? When he went before Nero, when he was going to go to this trial, when he was going to go give his defense, There were no other Christians around to support him. Luke didn't stay. Now, I understand this took a couple of years before this ever came up, but but Luke didn't stay. Where are the other people that were there in Rome? Where are the other Christians? Why weren't they there supporting him? He was all... The message might be fully proclaimed to all the Gentiles that they may hear it. He was standing there alone with the Lord, he felt, beside him, standing beside him. He felt the Lord was present with him, and in his strength that the Lord gave him, here's an old, old man, but in his strength he gave them. What was he doing? His main concern was not his defense. 
His main concern, his main concern was to share the gospel. He had an audience of all these Romans, of all these Gentiles, of all these people from all over. Here they were, and his first impulse was, I need to share the gospel with them, what the story of God is about. In 1 Corinthians 15, we've looked at before, First Corinthians 15, it was of first importance that Christ died for our sins, was buried and was resurrected. It was the first important thing he did. Here is my opportunity. And so now Paul is hauled in before, who was a terrible, terrible emperor. He was a terrible man. In fact, he got his just re uh, reward later. But he's hauled in before him. All the pomp, all the thing. Here is the most powerful man in the world. Nero. And here is Paul. What an incredible contrast we have between Nero and God's humble servant. I want to share with you just a paragraph out of the book Acts of the Apostles because I think it really capsulizes this moment. Once more, Paul has an opportunity to uplift before the wondering multitude the banner of Christ. Look at that. The banner of the cross. As he gazes upon the throne uh, before him and the throng, Jews, Greeks, Romans, with strangers from many lands, his soul is stirred with an intense desire for their salvation. He loses sight he loses sight of the occasion of which why he was there and the perils surrounding him and of the terrible fate that seems so near. He sees only Jesus, the intercessor, excuse me, sees the intercessor who will take care of him. With more human eloquence and power, Paul presents the truths of the gospel. He points his hearers to the sacrifice made for the fallen race. He's there to appeal to Caesar to be defended. He's there to Caesar to make that. And what is the first thing on his mind? He loses the significance. It's not important. My life is not important, he's saying. This is not important to me. What is important to me is the gospel of Christ. And here is the moment that I can present it. To me, that's astounding. He's completely unconcerned about what's going to happen to him. Because Paul knew his fate. He knew his fate. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that this opportunity was really not important to defend himself. Just finishing that thought. Though he may perish... The gospel will not perish. God lives, and his truth will triumph. We must never lose sight of that fact. We may perish, but the gospel of Christ will never perish. And it will triumph. God has assured us of that. And now, down through more than 2,000 years later, it still is. And I'm able to stand here at this moment and proclaim the cross of Christ. All right, back, back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're picking this up. I'm going to back up a little bit and get kind of Paul's sentiment. Notice this. I'm sure many of you have read this. Verse 6, For I am ready, I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward me on that day. And not only to me, but also, to all who love or who long for his appearing. My father always was talking about 
the soon return of Christ. He was shocked that he lived long enough to get married. He never thought that would happen. Never thought he'd have children. Never thought he'd have grandchildren. <laughs> never thought he'd retire. The Lord will come too soon. And uh, he passed away at 95. He knew that he was dying. And um, my dad, I wasn't able to be there, but he called my sisters who were local, and they came in to see him, and he said, I wanted to have prayer with you because I'm going to go now. And um, he said, I don't want us to ever forget Jesus is coming, that Jesus is coming. 95 years he held that in his heart. Jesus is coming. So <clears throat> after his funeral, I asked him, well, what do, you want, what do we want to put on his grave marker? I knew immediately what should be on his grave marker. And I said, put the words, the blessed hope. The blessed hope. It was always in his heart, the blessed hope. Always there. Always held and cherished that one. Of the blessed hope. And for all of us who wait for his appearing, it is our blessed hope. Purchased for us a place to be able to have that hope by the cross of Christ. Second Timothy, verse 1. Now just go back a little bit. Second Timothy, verse 1. And we're going to look at chapter, uh, verse 12. Second Timothy, verse 1. This is why I am suffering, he said, as I am. Because there is no cause for shame. Because I know whom I have believed. And am convinced that he is able to guard that what I have entrusted to him until that day. I know whom I believed. It's not some fable. I saw him on the road. I felt his presence. I knew he was standing beside me, as it were, when I was talking to Nero. I've owned, I know what it is to have a relationship with him. I know who the Christ is. Reminds me of Isaiah 26.3. You will you will keep in perfect peace whose minds are steadfast because they do what? They trust in you. They trust in you. Through the life and the ups and the downs of our life, through those struggles that we have, our minds can be at perfect peace no matter what happens. You may know the story of Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford lived in uh, Chicago, Illinois. He was a businessman. And he had his family. He had three daughters and his wife. And uh, they decided they wanted to go travel to Europe. Well, he couldn't go at that very moment, but he put them on the boat and said, I'll catch up with you. And so he would get coming a little later. So they were crossing the Atlantic in a boat. Storm came up. And the ship went down. When she arrived, when Anna arrived in Europe, she was the only one who survived of her family, of that family. And she sent back a message to him. And she said to him, all our daughters have been lost. Only I have been saved. And when he got that message, he immediately went down and got booked a passage and headed off back to Europe to be with his wife. And as he was crossing, he was, as he was going, the captain said to him, you know, this is the spot where the ship went down. Now, how would you feel about that? How would you respond to that? This is the place where your daughters were lost, that you loved, cherished them in your heart. And he went out, stood on the edge, and he wrote these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrow like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. 
You know that as a hymn, don't you? Many of you, I've, I had a quartet that we sang this as a hymn. It's a beautiful hymn. But the words from this man out of his pain. How can we stand on the deck where your daughters are lost? Say it is well, it is well with my soul. The only way is because of your trust in Jesus. There's only peace that comes with Jesus. Well, Nero ordered Paul to behead it. He could not be tortured. He could not be tortured because he uh, was a Roman citizen. So the way they took care of that was they beheaded him. Now, you could imagine just going out and this old man took him out and beheaded him. And there's a comment, it's about 50 years after Christ's resurrection. About, about 50 years later, this happened. So he was an old man when this happened, and he was beheaded for Christ, became a martyr. Nero later prayed for this. <laughs> later prayed. So we have a connection between 2 Timothy and Acts 28. So 2 Timothy helps us understand what happened to Paul while he was going through his trial. 2 Timothy gets that last kind of will and testament, as it were, for this. But I want to go back to Acts 28 to pick up this very little tag. And this is for what Paul would say. Verse 20, he said, For this reason, for this reason I have asked to see you and talk with you. And he's talking about his trial and his trial. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. It is because the hope of Israel, as he's talking before all these people, these Jewish leaders, this is Agrippa. So what is the hope of Israel? What was he talking about when he says the hope of Israel? What were they looking for? The hope of Israel is they were looking for the promised Messiah. They were looking for him, expecting him to arrive. And in Bethlehem, remember? So they were expecting him to come. And here is Paul standing before them. And at those trials and before Nero, he picks up that same exact theme and saying, it's Jesus, Jesus, and him crucified. You know, that's it. My dear brothers and sisters, that's it. If you boil down to the heart of it, it's Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because he gives us the hope. And we rely on him. Well, this story, as I was reading this and looking at this story, I couldn't help but put myself there and think of Nero and the courtroom and Paul standing by himself. And yet his faith and trust in Christ was so real and so personal that he could stand boldly, setting aside his own fate, setting aside trying to get any defense. He made no defense other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. And even Nero didn't go as far as Agrippa saying, you've almost persuaded me, but even Nero and those listening had to be touched. And we're told that even some that were listening there became believers because of the testimony, the experience, the preaching. Not because it was eloquent, but because it was truth. And truth is what brings light. Not eloquence. Not because he was a great speaker. Probably was, but that's not what impressed them. What impressed them was the biblical truth. Even though they were Jews and Gentiles and Romans and people from all over the the country, all over the world, gathered there to hear this because they wanted to hear this trial because of what was happening. And it was truth that made the difference. We must always share the truth. The truth of Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's why we exist. There are other people who lift up Jesus, and I'm happy for them, aren't you?
other denominations who love Jesus, I'm delighted for them. But there's truth. There's truth in what we believe. That's why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist because my parents were. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist because it's just convenient. I became convinced of the truth in Scripture. And so if I'm going to be truthful to myself and to my own conscience, then I have to follow the truth of Scripture making no judgment about others, but I have to settle it within my own mind. How about you? Settle it within your own mind. And the truth shall set you free. You can uh, quote me on that if you like. The truth shall set you free. So here's Paul. And it was Jesus and him crucified that he preached that day before him. In fact, the whole Bible preaches Christ and him crucified. Dear Lord, I thank you for this powerful message that of Paul's complete faithful regard for you and not worrying about his own fate, but that he was able to stand before him and deliver the gospel with power and with truth. You inspired him because of your love. Your spirit was there in that room, and people became believers. May we always, always have that in our heart, because it leads us to the blessed hope, the blessed hope of Christ and him crucified. Jesus be with us in this hours that we are living in of turmoil and distress. In Jesus' name, amen.